Yoga has helped me to better understand my relationships with almost everything except money. The fact is, I haven't experienced much money as a yoga teacher, and frankly, I want and need more. My guest today, Bailey Slevin, has been helping creatives, solopreneurs, and so many others find a happy, healthy relationship with money. She's a finance ninja and has so much to share. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. So let's get started. Welcome to the Youthful Older Yogi Podcast. I'm MJ Waddell, your yogi host and founder of Share Yoga. I've been practicing, teaching, and loving yoga for over 25 years. I'm an advocate of movement, creativity, and staying healthy in mind and body after 50. And so are my guests. It's never too late to start, and there's a lot of healthy years ahead. So let's start now. Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to the Youthful Older Yogi. I'm MJ Waddell, the host and creator of Share Yoga. And I have a, a, not an unusual, but kind of a topic that many wellness professionals and creatives are hesitant to talk about. It's about money. So I have today on a guest and a friend of mine. Her name is Bailey Slevin. And Bailey is a financial ninja. She knows how to take financial, um, like she just puts it into plain, understandable English. And she's on a mission to increase financial literacy and help wellness professionals professionals and creatives with a comprehensive financial plan, which we all need. She has many multiple certifications and leaderships and mental health support groups. Um, and her ultimate goal is just to empower people in their financial life. Um, she is truly wonderful and has helped me immensely. I've known her for about 10 years, maybe 11 years or so. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So um, Bailey, thank you so much for taking the time out to be on the podcast. I'm so happy you're here. I am so happy to be here too. You're helping me on my mission and also I get to hang out with you. So like win-win. Awesome. All right. Well, let's start out. Tell our listeners how you found your way into finance. Quite literally by accident. Uh, I was a stage manager and I was in school for massage therapy in the city, which I was really passionate about. And it was an 18-month program, the Swedish Institute, which is called something else now. Um, but three weeks before graduating, I was in a car accident. And I shattered my right elbow and humerus. And as you can imagine, that took me out of massaging uh, pretty much for good. Although I did go back and somehow get my diploma from there. They must have just been very kind to me because I couldn't use an arm. Um. But as I was recuperating and trying to figure out what to do, because I couldn't go back to stage managing either, my arm, I was in a year and a half of physical therapy for it. Like, that's how they rebuilt it. And after a few weeks on their couch, my parents came in. They were like, honey, we love you. And I was like, oh, my God, I love you, too. And then I said, are you planning on going back to work anytime soon? And I said, I am bored out of my mind. So you find someone who will hire me like this. And I will work for them. Now, you should never make a blanket statement like that, looking back. However, I did it. And my dad, who's a financial advisor, um, became one after being a songwriter in the 70s and composer. He said, uh, you're coming to work for me. You'll fill out paperwork. This is back when it had to be done by hand. And I'm left-handed, so I could do it. And I was like, okay. I said, show me someone who will hire me, and I'll work for them. And so. I did. And after a couple of days of filling out his paperwork, I was like, you know what? I really want to know what I'm doing. I want to know what this paperwork does. And my dad said, I didn't think you'd be interested, but you can sit in on the training classes. I said, great. The first day I was in there, they explained the intricacies, not even the crazy intricacies, but really the details about how auto insurance worked. I grew up in New Jersey. I had been driving for nearly a decade at that point, and they told me things that I did not know. And so I called friends. I called friends who had no college degrees, and I called friends who went to Ivy League schools. And I said, hey, 
did anyone ever teach you this? Like, did you ever learn this? And across the board, the answer was no. And so as I healed, I faced this choice of, do I go back to theater and be just another great stage manager when there aren't even enough shows for the great stage managers who are out there now? Or do I stay in finance and do something for the people I know and the communities I love that no one else really is doing? I've never met someone else who had the same exact passion and drive for the communities I want to work with. So that is the slightly extended version of how I ended up here. No, I, well, I, I knew a little bit of it. I didn't know that your dad was a singer songwriter. That's a new piece of information for me. So <laughs> you truly are in, you know, around surrounded with creatives, you know, and um, I think everyone is a creative. I use that term like, because Bailey and I have been in theater and are still in theater, but everyone is a creative to me. So, um, and you've had a history as a stage manager and in theater. And um, so coming with that, can you fill us in on the many, many other gigs that you've had in between stage management and between your finance? And because I'm sure there's many, any any that, that really stand out to you? Like, oh, this is the weirdest yeah. job you've ever had. I mean, well, my my biggest off-Broadway job was I was the PSM for Naked Boys Singing for a little over a month. And that, it was at New World Stages in Manhattan. And it was quite an experience because the boys start the show naked. And one day the intercom system went out and I had to go call places in person. <laughs> and I got home to my my boyfriend at the time and I was like, Keep your pants on, sir. I do not want to see another one. Um, I love it. <laughs> so that was definitely memorable. Yes, yes. Um, I did the first Jason Robert Brown approved revival of Songs for a New World. I was the general manager on that. He actually stopped by and gave us a talk back. And I'm proud to say that uh, my brother met my sister-in-law, who is the choreographer on that. So I take responsibility for my niece and nephew being born. Uh, so those were good. I produced uh, two staged readings, actually, of a show called Popsicle that ended up in the New York Fringe Festival uh, with a different producer. I really just like doing the staged readings. I find things I want to see. And if it's not already happening, I try to make it happen just as like a passion project. This got picked up and did really well there. So I try to stay up to date with theater and doing something each year. A big part of that for me has been a, a company called True Theater Resources Unlimited. I was a board member for a while, and now I do a lot of speaking to playwrights who are trying to figure out how to pitch their shows to producers, because that's getting investors, that's selling. And I've been a sales trainer also. I've trained other financial advisors in. So I, I try to switch it up but client work is really the best. I wanted to pop in to thank you for listening to The Youthful Older Yogi. It's season two, and I'm so excited to bring you more great guests, education, and ways for you to stay youthful in mind and body after 50. If you love the show and want to help me make it even better, please consider becoming a supporter. You get to choose how much and how often you give, and there's no commitment. And remember, I donate a portion of every dollar I receive to charity. For 2024, I've chosen UNICEF. Just click the support button in the show notes. And just as helpful is sharing the show with other youthful older yogis. Thank you again so much for listening. And now let's get back to the podcast. Well, I think it's all interconnected. And for listeners, PSM stands for Production Stage Manager. And basically, this, the production stage manager does everything, literally everything. So it's not, it's not a uh, glamorous job that you think of when you see a show. It's, it's, uh, they are uh, the, they're the fixers and hopefully everything runs smoothly. So, and I, and I think all of that has led to how proficient you are in your job as a financial ninja. Um, and, so you've been in and out of the finance uh, scene, and then recently you've just returned to it, and because there was an unfortunate event that occurred, 
And so now you're really, really passionate about helping entrepreneurs. And if you're willing to share with our audience that story, um, I think it will um, hit home for a lot of people. Absolutely. Um, so during the pandemic, I took, you know, the pandemic pivot that a lot of us did and decided to spend some time on myself, taking a mental health journey, really just figuring out what it is I wanted out of life. Um, there's a saying in, in financial advising, especially among people who do life insurance, disability insurance, long-term care insurance, all these really like terrible <laughs> insurances that you never want to have to use. But they say you're not really a financial advisor until you deliver your first death benefit check. And I had never done that. I still haven't done that, which is why I'm here. Um, a friend of mine who is 46 and a single mother had an aneurysm and, and dropped dead in front of her son, uh, who is eight. She was a client. She was a client when I first started in the business. I've known her for nearly 20 years. And when I first started, we were both in our like mid twenties and she got approved for life insurance. And I went to put it in place and she was like, I'm single. I'm not getting married. I'm not having kids. I don't need this. And I wasn't experienced enough to really make the case for what the future was because mm -hmm. I was still new. Mm -hmm. um, I was having the same conversations with myself about if I needed life insurance. Cut two years later, she's married. She has a kid. We go, great. We know you're older. It'll be a little bit more expensive for the life insurance, but now we got to get it. And I started taking her medical information and she had a medical situation going on that we just couldn't even put her through the underwriting process to try to get approved because they needed to know what the end result was. And it went on for long enough that by the time it was resolved, I was out of the industry over COVID. And so when I found out that she passed, I didn't blame myself because that doesn't help anybody. But I realized that had things been different, I could have shown up with a check for $500,000 for her kid. Mm -hmm. And there wouldn't have been, is he staying in New York? Is he not staying in New York? Like there are so many things that that money could have helped with. And I just wasn't there. I wasn't in the industry. And so a GoFundMe went up and I was like, it didn't need to be this way. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't. And I was talking to my dad, who's been trying to get me back into the business since the second I told him I was leaving. Mm -hmm. uh, I I was like, this is, it's crazy. And again, like, it's, it's hard for me not to blame myself, but I know <laughs> that I, I can't. But what I've learned from this is I never want to show up at another funeral without a check ever again. Mm -hmm. And it's in my power to do that. And so... I used to focus just on working with people in the arts because those are my people and I love them and I'm not going anywhere. And honestly, I even include the wellness community there because of my uh, massage therapy background. I understand that really well. Now, I want to talk to everyone. I had a business plan before. Now I have a mission and it's a very different way of approaching this business. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry that that happened that that I'm glad you're back in the business, but I'm sorry it was that event that, you know, that's it. And, you know, so many of us have witnessed or gone through someone that just unexpectedly passed with no warning, right? Even like my mom had a, had a stroke and died, you know, and she was not, not hospitalized or sick. So I, I understand it. So it's, yeah. fortunately, my parents had things in place, but but that's um, it's a it's a hard fact that we don't know how much time we have, <laughs> we just don't. And you know, I'm single, I'm unmarried, I don't have kids, so. But you know, thanks to you, I have things in place. But it's uh, when you're younger, you just think you don't have to worry about it. And I think, I think that's just what being twenty is. You don't worry, <laughs> you don't think about the future until actually. You come into your 40s and 50s, and you're in the future. Hello, here's your future. Yeah. It's here now. So it's like, oh, it really does happen. 
And I want to just tell our listeners that we met in around 2012, 2011, 2012. Um, through a recommendation of a wonderful stage manager, friend, both of our friends, she's friends of both of us. And um, I had just recently been divorced unexpectedly. I was 51 or 52 when we met you, when I met you. And I had so much shame and embarrassment about my, first of all, lack of finances because I left with $400. And uh, and you were so wonderful. And I was in a show at the time, so I was actually had an income, which was nice. <laughs> and and then through the divorce, I got some extra money. And anyway, um, I I'm so grateful that that we connected. And but the the sense of shame and embarrassment that I had about being in my 50s with no, no financial literacy, nothing. I didn't know anything. My parents brought me up. You work, just save your money. Just put it in the bank. I'm like, well, I'm in theater. When I work, my money has to pay rent. And then I have to go to unemployment until my next gig or do a million or wait tables or whatever it is. So what would you say to uh, clients that come to you feeling this way, no matter what their age is or their circumstances? I would say, first of all, I think about 80% of the people who come to me have some sort of embarrassment that they're working with. So it is you should never feel isolated in your embarrassment over money. We, as a country, do not teach people how our financial industry works. We just don't. So there's no way that you could have known. Also, it's not your job. Right. You go to the doctor and you're not like, oh, my God, I'm so embarrassed. I don't know all the bones in my foot and the tendons to figure out what's wrong. You go to the doctor and say, you're a specialist. Here's my situation. Work with me. Now, I like to think I have better bedside manner than any doctor I've ever worked with. But it's the same idea. Right. You don't go to your accountant and say, you know, I'm so embarrassed that I don't know what the up updates to the tax code were this year. You go to your accountant and you say, you're the expert do my taxes, and then explain it to me if I have questions. And so it's the same thing with me. It doesn't matter. I have people literally like right out of college who come and they're like, my parents never talked about money. I don't know. I know that I'm not supposed to have debt and I know that I'm supposed to save. I also know that some months I can't afford my rent because you know I'm piecing together all these jobs. I've also met with people who are like in their 40s and 50s who have hundreds of thousands of dollars and they come in and they go, am I doing it right? I don't know. So everyone is going to come not knowing. That's why you talk to a professional. And I think it's really key. One, you're not isolated in that embarrassment, like I said. And two, you don't have to be embarrassed. You never were supposed to know this. And especially if you're in the arts, or I imagine it's the same in wellness, where it's such a focus on like inside and you and what you put into the world. Um, and you're kind of told the money will work itself out or not. You should be a starving artist, which is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I've been quoted on that many times. Dumbest thing I've ever heard, starving artists. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it came from this idea, you know, you have to suffer to make great art. I know multimillionaires who are absolutely miserable. You can be miserable with money and make art. <laughs> so we we got to get past all of that and say, and I can talk about this more if you want, but really looking at the future and having this vision. And a lot of times it's so hard when you're stuck in a financial rut or even if you're dealing with physical issues. Like I know when I have pain flare-ups, the future somehow completely disappears for me. And it's like, I'll never move again. I won't be able to pick up a kettlebell and the world is and like two days later. I'm like, I'm sore, but no, it wasn't the end of the world. Yeah, I agree. It's it's a very um, you know, that kind of thinking of, oh, just just work more. Work more. And you'll make and then you'll just well, you'll come into burnout or exhaust yourself. And, you know, when I lived in New York and I lived in New York multiple times and did multiple jobs and 
I'd get a big job and then I'd like live off that for a little bit. And then I'd get a crap job and go, no, I gotta wait. To, and it's, but I, even today in my sixties, I'm still, I have four jobs. I'm still doing gig work, um, but it's gig work that I like. And, and I think um, our relationship with money starts out so, so, so early, but I was always taught just work more, make more money and just save it. I'm like, well, how can you save it? Especially in today's world. It's like, it's so difficult to, you know, if you're just a solopreneur, I'm talking from a solopreneur perspective, which is my perspective without, you know, partner, any other income, but, but my own. So and I want to talk about the early relationship with money. Um, and are there some like trustworthy resources out there besides yourself, of course, that people can start to, to learn about money because there's so many, oh, you should do this. You should do that. You should do this. And then it's like any, there's so much information. You just don't know where to start sometimes. Yeah. The first thing, honestly, is to just definitions. If you know that you have a 401k or an IRA and you're in mutual funds, do you know what a mutual fund is? Do you know how it works? And for that, you can just Google it. You can even Google whatever the ticker symbol is. Mm -hmm. And it'll give you some more information. The more you look at it, the clearer it gets. Um, Morningstar.com is actually a great reference to say, oh, this is my investment. How is it doing? You can put it in. They have a free version. Um, I send a lot of my clients off with that. Mm -hmm. um, or when I'm doing a full plan review that I never put into place, like someone comes in, we pull that up and we look at every investment. So definitions are a great place. I always am hesitant about the financial pundits. I take issue with a lot of how they present what they say. I've been spending a lot of time self-reflecting on how I feel about these things. No, it's and good. It's good. Because I don't want to hate things, right? You don't want to just blanket statement, all financial pundits are wrong. They're not all wrong, but they're not all right. So say you're listening to Susie Orman. One thing to pay attention to for her, one is that she's not a financial advisor. There's nothing wrong with that, but she's a financial entertainer. Two, her job because of that isn't to make you more money. That's not her job. Her job is to get viewership for her show and sell her books. Again, so she's not a financial planner. No, you are not allowed to be licensed and say the things that she says to a wide audience. And oh, this is yeah. where the trouble is because she's not necessarily wrong, right? which hurts my soul, but she's not necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. So the question you have to ask when you're watching her or Dave Ramsey or anyone else or reading their books is, does this apply to me? Do I reflect back the client and the situation she's speaking about? So I live in New York City and generally speaking, people make more there than they do elsewhere, just because people know you have to pay them more mm -hmm. to stay there. Susie Orman will give advice for a couple living in the Midwest whose gross household income with two people is never going to exceed $60,000. Mm -hmm. And that might be great advice for them. But if you are someone who say lives in New York, it's probably not the right advice for you. You might never want to buy property because <laughs> opening an apartment in New York, is just a nightmare. Um, you might be single income. So it's really looking at this and saying, does this apply to me? A real example of that is Susie Orman, her own financial planning for herself is almost the exact opposite of what she preaches for everyone else. Now, why is that? doesn't make her a hypocrite. Her financial situation is completely different. Mm -hmm. So if she went and was like, oh, I'm just going to buy term insurance, that's not going to cover her estate planning needs. Mm -hmm. Term life insurance. Term life ends at a certain point. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to whole life, which will last your entire life. So for estate planning, that's what you got to use. But if you're someone where you're like, 
estate planning. Like, I'm not going to die with more than a million dollars of assets. Then you do it differently. Yeah. So whatever you're reading, just say, does this reflect my situation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that is the biggest piece. That's, that's great advice. And I wanted to talk about, um, you have, uh, it's called the eight dimensions of wellness that you like to use um, with your clients. And when you told me this, I'm like, well, there's eight limbs of yoga. <laughs> How appropriate is that? <laughs> I I bring everything back to yoga. It's all applicable as when you ask me anything. Yeah. Um, and then, so you explain the eight dimensions with me. Um, can you just briefly tell our listeners um, what what they are and why you think they're important? Yeah. So I developed a program called the Financial Wellness Companion, and this was. The idea that we could take financial advising and make it more like a wellness plan. The biggest issue that people have with saving and budgeting is they don't see the immediate payoff. Mm -hmm. So I was really spending time with all of my mental health training um, as a peer specialist and the financial stuff. And I was like, how, how can I make this? How, how can I make people want to budget and save? Right? That's a crazy question. <laughs> but I I came across the eight dimensions of wellness, uh, which are, and I will read them off because as much as I try, I never memorize them. So <laughs> emotional, financial, physical, intellectual, environmental, social, spiritual, and occupational. So the minute you read those off, like when you say emotional, okay. So when I think about money, I usually get emotional in the pit of my stomach and want to barf. Okay. What's the second one? The second one is financial. Financial. When I, well, before I met you, but I look at my bank statements every day thinking, oh my God, is, is, is it going to be zero? <laughs> it never is. So no, it never is. I know you. It never is, but I, you know, it's that, that fear or however I was raised. What's the third one? Physical. Physical. Yeah. There's a physical reaction to money either, either when I have something, you know, good come in or I recently, I just moved and I bought a dresser the other day and I was physically sick making the decision to buy a dresser. <laughs> Literally, I bought it. But I was like, good. I I just I was like, so that. But there's a physical sensation. What's the next one? Intellectual. Right. Well, here's the mind. The mind fuck story. <laughs> if I buy this dresser, I'm never going to buy have buy anything else again. My entire life, I'll be destitute, which is ridiculous. What's the next one? Environmental. So what's around you in general? Yes. You yes. Around me, I know a lot of people, a lot of my friends my age, mostly, I'm in my 60s, mostly have partners, have families, and I'm so, I'm not really in that environment, I'm, which is unusual for me. So I'm kind of in just my own environment. It's my own little bubble of financial uh, insecurity. <laughs> What's the next one? Social. Social. Okay, whenever I go out or people invite me to go out, I also stress about, oh, let the minute the menu comes, <laughs> what is the cheapest? It's, it's ridiculous. It's, it's, but the, I'm telling you, I'm being completely honest, but, or sometimes I'll go, well, you know, what restaurant is it? Where is it? And I'll think, nope, I can't go. Can't go, not in my budget. So that's the social aspect. Yep, spiritual. Oh, uh, well, I just pray all the time. I pray when I'm doing a scratch off. <laughs> but I never buy like any scratch off that's over $2. <laughs> like, the payoff's not going to be big anyway. <laughs> so like, oh my gosh, if I win $5. <laughs> is that the last one? Uh, occupational is the last one. Oh, well, like I said, I have four jobs. I'm just, I've been a gig. I've been in theater. I've done a million different jobs like you. So, and it's like, 
that's kind of like, will I ever not have to work so much? That's where the occupational question comes in. Yeah. Is that it? So, yeah. So looking at all of these things, I think your responses are so common. I'm sure everyone listening for at least four of those were like, yeah, that's me. That That's me. So we want to flip it on its head. So something like social, going out, going to the restaurants. I like to say when you have money, you can't do everything, but you can do anything. And we think about that priority. So maybe that's something where I would set up what I call the slush savings so that you're saving maybe just an extra 2% of everything that comes in specifically to go in that count for you to blow on a night out with the girls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then there's no guilt about it because that's what it was for. And so when we prioritize and say, well, how is all of this money helping me? So saving money. I will tell you as a financial advisor, I love spending money like way too much. It's, I get it. I get it. Um, But when we're looking at the benefits later. We talked, I think I told you about the deferred shopping account. Yes, I love that. Right? I I had a client who loved buying handbags and I was like, look, there's only so much money in your life. So what if we save for future handbags? It's a deferred shopping account because there's a limit to what you can get. Mm -hmm. Now that limit might expand and expand and expand over time, but whoever you are, your life is finite. So your choices and your money is is finite through a budget I really like to say all right so I'm saving it's pissing me off right now because I'd rather spend it but emotionally when I look at my savings account balance every day like I do I'm gonna feel real good I'm gonna go that was the right choice even if it's just I'm trying to cut down on how much delivery I get for dinner I'm become very lazy so now whenever I don't order it I actually put the order in of what I would get. I look at the t- the total and I put that into my savings account instead of pressing order. Mm-hmm. And then the next day I'm like, that's right. That's $43 I didn't spend on sushi. Congratulations, me. And for that, like that does so much. One, it makes me healthier because then I have to cook. There are all these things. So if we can take a look at a budget and say, how is this benefiting you? Let's not talk about the discomfort. We'll acknowledge it and move on. But what do you get? How is this feeding you? How is your financial choice feeding you? And I love that there's there's eight different ways because it's not just a blank thing. Oh, I just feel this way about money. Yeah. Such a vast topic. And, um, And especially environment where you came from. And the environment you're in now could be completely opposite. It's really crazy when I meet with people and inevitably we get to talking about their childhood and their first interactions with money. So there was, if I was talking to a former trainer of mine, a gym trainer, and I said, you know, what's your first memory of money? Because I'm really interested in this. And he said, You know, my dad used to say that he was off to work to make money. And I thought he literally printed money. And that's what he brought home to to, for us to live on. Um, So it's really interesting how all of that that forms us. Because there are all different personas in our head who are making these financial choices. And let's be honest, for all of us, you know, the five-year-old in us makes some of our financial choices. So does the 15-year-old. You know, so do our parents. So do what's ever passed on generation to generation, the priorities, right? So you see families who all drive really nice cars because that's just become what they do, whether they can afford it or not. But you'll see the same thing. People buy reasonable cars because that's what they do. And it it travels down. People go out to eat or they don't go out to eat. We order delivery. We don't order delivery. And it's either going to be an embracing of how you or a forced embracing of how you grew up, or there's going to be a moment of rebellion where I get people who come to me and they say, look, my parents were so bad with money. I don't know how we survived, but they were terrible and they told me nothing. 
So I need to do better because I can't do what they do. And then we also have people who they're like, oh, my family was so good with money. They had so much income. They did all this investing. I'm choosing a different life. Mm -hmm. How do I adjust how I live so that I'm still happy, even though it's not what I grew up with? Yeah, I, I love it. It's, it is. It's so, it is taking a good, long, hard look at and doing the work about your relationship with money and your mindset about it. Um, and there are some very hard facts that a lot of yoga teachers, wellness professionals, uh, theater performers, artists, they, there's just uh, many of us don't make the money that we deserve. Um, and also there's some hesitancy about asking for what we're worth. Um, so what would you suggest to struggling um, entrepreneurs of any, of any type the first thing uh, is to make a business plan, mm -hmm. right? If you're a solopreneur, maybe you're working four gigs, maybe you're working one, maybe by the end of the year, you're like, oh my God, I have 25 1099s, what happened here? Um, but to make a business plan mm -hmm. and a business plan isn't just here's where I'm working and here's where the income is, it's what's my goal for the year. Mm -hmm. And that goal could be financial or it could be emotional. Like, what do I want to accomplish? So that's really the first place <laughs> I will bring up my Alice in Wonderland quote right now. Because this is which really- I love. I love this it, one. Yeah, I have a tattoo inspired by it because I was like, this is it. So Alice is walking down the path in the forest and she comes to a fork in the road and there are signs, but they're Wonderland signs. So it's like this way, that way, right way, wrong way. She has no idea where to go. And the Cheshire cat appears. And she says, Kat, which way do I go? And he says, well, that depends on where you're trying to get to. And she says, I don't know. So he says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. And I think a lot of freelancers and solopreneurs are stuck in that, I just want to go forward. But forward doesn't matter unless you know where you're going. Right? So... That's the first thing is to even say, hey, to live the life that I want, I need to make $70,000 this year. Or to live the life that I want, I need to make $250,000 this year. Now it's a goal. Are you bad or wrong if you don't hit it by the end of the year? No, but you knew where you were going. And there's this thing to envision and you write it down, right? Because we know things are more likely to happen if we write them down. So from that, then you can do, all right, if I need to make this much money and let's say I'm going to take a month off throughout the year of working days. So now I need to make that money in 10 months. I'll work X amount of hours. Like what's the average I need to make hourly, daily, weekly, monthly to get there? And then there's a little bit of, can I do this with where I am right now? What do I need to change? Now, you might look at that and say, you know what? The things I would need to change are not things I'm willing to change. I'm okay with making less money to have the freedom or the enjoyment or working with my friends, whatever it is. You can say that, and then it's a powerful choice and not I missed my goal. This comes back to the eight dimensions of wellness, right? Making a boatload of money doesn't matter if you're miserable. Right. So that's the first thing, because then you're going to have this real information and you could go into a, a job and say, look, this is what I need to make. Right. Now, are they going to go? Yes, of course. Thank you so much for bringing that to our attention. Probably not. But you have a business plan and you've done your research. So you can say, I have 20 people consistently showing up for this class when I teach it. When someone else teaches at the same time, you do not get the same attendance levels. Therefore, I am more valuable to you and a raise of $2 per class is what's going to be appropriate. Now, always ask for a little more, not an unreasonable amount more, but a little bit more so you can have your little bargaining thing. Because really, what's the worst they're going to say? Especially if you're a popular teacher. They're not going to be like, you asked for $5 more per class, you're fired. They're going to go, no. And then you're just where you are. 
But we have to ask, and the more you can have the evidence to back it up, the better. Yeah, I agree. I agree with you totally. For newer entrepreneurs, I'm speaking just about yoga teachers right now. If you're just starting out, you take any gig you can. Just like when you're in theater, you take any gig you can. But after a while, after you're in the business 5, 10, 15 years, and you you are consistently working or getting booked or whatever, that's when you go. And I've just started to do it now myself. You know, say, I have a workshop and I have to make this this amount of money for it to benefit me and to benefit your studio. And it's either a yes or no. So there's no there's no harm in just asking that. It may or may not work out, but I think um, you know, in theater there's a contract and there's you you know, we all did this. You take whatever gig you can get when you're starting out because you have to build your resume and you yeah. have to meet people and you have to build up, you know, the responsibility of showing up and being on time and, and having talent and all of it. It's not just, oh, you're talented, so you get the gig. No, not at all. Yes. And I would say even with that, find some mentorship. If you're new, connect with yoga instructors who have been around for a little while. Make sure that you know what the next step is. Yeah. Or are you getting paid less than they did when they started? So now you have I do believe to some extent that we should take whatever work is there when we're just starting out, but that's also a good time to start just giving a little pushback as to self-worth. There's no reason on your first class, they say, we're going to pay you $20 for this class, and you say, I was really looking for 22 So they say no, but now you're someone who has proven to them that you know your worth from day one. I love that. That's great advice. Really good advice. So there's one other, I love your attitude about life and about money. Um, and so there's a couple of gems that you shared with me. And we, I always have a pre-interview before we do the recording. Um, we did the Alice, the deferred shopping account. Um, name the baby. Talk to me uh, about name the baby. I love name the baby. It kind of came from the idea that there's an elephant in the room. Um, is it the idea, the other version also I call, by the way, don't poop on the table. Um, cause if you're sitting at a table with someone and you're having a conversation, but like there's something that's not said, someone's uncomfortable. Maybe, you know, you're asking for money in this conversation. So it's weird. Guess what? You're going to be weird. The other person is going to know something's up and it's like, there's poop on the table. Everyone's just kind of, you know, like the little poop face for anyone who's watching on YouTube. I'm making the poop face. Um, and it's not going to be okay until you name the baby, until you say, if it's you're talking about money, you can say, you know, I'm really excited to have this conversation. I do want to be upfront. I want to talk to you about money, and it's not something I talk about all the time. So, you know, I just wanted to let you know, we're not in my comfort zone, but I really think it's important for us to have this conversation. That's wonderful. That that right there, that's a great opening. Everyone should memorize that. Thank you, Bailey. <laughs> Absolutely. It gives, gives everyone permission to have an honest conversation. Mm -hmm. I love that. Makes, yeah, it makes the other person feel better, right? right? Because we've all been there. We're like, I know you're going to tell me something I don't want to know. Can we just get to it? I'm not going to push you. Everyone's making the poop face. Yeah. <laughs> then someone <laughs> says it, and you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. It's fine. It's like breaking it's the ice. Nice. It's like a great icebreaker, too. So, and and you just get to the point quicker instead of suffer. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think you've witnessed me do it in meetings where I'll come in and I'll be like, I'm really sorry. The subway was absolutely atrocious. It's going to take me like five to 10 minutes to get my head screwed on, but I want to jump in. Let me know if I'm all over the place. Yes. How much better is that than showing up and just being like, what were we talking about? Whose money? What do you teach? <laughs> Love it. Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, I ask all my guests how they feel about aging. So are you are you in your 40s yet? I am. I am 43. I'm proud of it. 43. How are you feeling about aging? 
here's, I will be very clear about this. I have almost died multiple times in my life. Every year is a gift and an accomplishment. And I cannot wait until I'm in my 90s being crotchety to everyone and lecturing the youth of the world. I love it. I love it. And so as you're leaning into the later years, have you noticed, well, I know you've done a lot of, of work, emotional work and, you know, just viewing your, your life. Has there been a draft drastic shift in any area of your life that most surprised has been surprising to you? So I talked about the need to see the future before and excuse me if I get like a slight bit emotional about this but it was like a major moment for me I have severe PTSD that results in some really nasty bouts of anxiety depression um and really all the nastiness that comes with this that we don't need to talk about um but I I was in the worst place I, I was ever in and I decided to check myself into the hospital because I didn't feel like I was safe um and when I was in there, they we they were groups, and I decided to just throw myself into this experience. I was like, I'm never committing myself ever again, so I'm just going to get everything out of it. And one of them, they asked, like, your vision for the future. And I sat there staring at this paper, and I was like, I don't know. If my dog dies, I don't think there's really anything else. Like, I don't see anything else in the future. I know there's stuff. I have family. I have like I'm close with them, I'm close with friends. I don't lead an empty life by any means. But I was sitting there going, I I don't see it. Like I there's no future that I can imagine. Everything is so immediate. And when I got out a few weeks later, I remember it so clearly. I was standing in my apartment which had a view of the George Washington Bridge. And I was looking out and I had this vision of like all the things I could do and just in the future that they weren't happening now, but they were goals and they were achievable. They weren't pie in the sky. If that dog died as terrible as it was, I would get another one. I would watch my nibblings grow up. Like there was all this stuff. And I can't tell you that moment where I was like, I didn't know there was a future for like 38 years of my life. I had no concept of it. And so now, even at you know my advanced age, I look at it, and I'm like, there's just so much to be accomplished and finished and done. And that's that's been huge for me to actually, I think that's why I can do what I'm doing now and why I was so just stopped in my tracks when my friend was the first contemporary of mine died. I was like, not only is there a future, but it is like not guaranteed before I just was like, nothing is guaranteed. And then I was like, oh, there's this future. And now like you gotta do, you have to work for it and you have to take advantage of it. So yeah, that there's future and no matter how old you are, there's future. We just celebrated my mom's 70th birthday and all we talked about was her future. And I think it's a beautiful thing. That's that's a big reason I'm doing this podcast because the youthful older yogi because there's just so much more life ahead, and and they're going to be great years. The you know it's so I'm so glad you feel that way. That's wonderful, and um, so we've talked about presenting a, a presentation for entrepreneurs with Bailey. We've talked about this, and where we would set up a, a Zoom call and you could ask any questions it would be free and um we want to know if you're interested in that so if you are you have to subscribe to my newsletter it's free i only send it out twice a month because i'm a solopreneur and i can't do anything more than that and this and my four gigs so <laughs> so if you um the the website will be in the show notes it's also at the end of this podcast it's share yoga with MJ dot offering tree dot com. You will find if you just Google share yoga with MJ, you'll you'll find it. So we'd like to put this presentation presentation together to, you know, offer up some maybe you have some questions that you 
or maybe you just want to listen because you don't even know what questions to ask. What would you say about that, Bailey? Yeah. Um, so the way that I would see it is I was I would do a basic presentation, a lot of vocabulary, but vocabulary in context so that we can understand what a Roth IRA looks like next to a regular IRA next to a SEP IRA. And then I'd encourage people just put their questions, um, either send them before or put them in the comments. And the second half of almost every workshop I do is just me going down questions and answering them. If there are any that I don't have the answers to, then I will find someone who does and connect you with them. Awesome. So I'm thinking this will happen within the next 30 to 45 days. Do you feel like that's yeah. a good time period? Maybe, maybe two months. We'll figure it out. But um, because I have to tell my listeners that Bailey has helped me immensely. Um, and I was with her father for a couple of years while she was doing other gigs. <laughs> <laughs> and um, who's also wonderful, but now she's back, and I'm so uh, so blessed that I've reconnected because she has really made me feel so much more comfortable about money and and the future and a plan and all of it. So that's why I wanted to share this podcast with with you and um, and Bailey. Uh, hopefully, can also bring some some knowledge and. Hopefully you'll you'll work with her if you don't have a or if you're looking for a really knowledgeable ninja in finances. <laughs> Bailey. And yeah, if people are interested also in in a consult, I'm happy to do a 30 minute consultation for anyone who comes through this podcast. Wonderful. Okay, last question before we go. I ask all my guests, usually the question is, knowing all you've learned and all your life experiences, what would you tell your younger self? But I rephrase it and say, now with all your life experience and your knowledge and you know what you've learned, what do you want to tell your future self? Oh, my future self. <laughs> Come back and tell me everything you know from the future. <laughs> no. Um, I think I'd like to tr tell my future self that even though she probably knows this, we did the best we could do, and that was great. And we couldn't have done any better. Love it. That's so wonderful. Okay. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Bailey, thank you again so much. In the show notes, we'll have Bailey's um, website and and my website. So, And then you when you subscribe to the newsletter, once we get the date and everything, you will receive information about when, when the date will be. Okay. Um, and again, Bailey, thank you so much. I'm so grateful that you're part of this podcast and that you're back in my life and you're handling my my finances and my my ego. And my, and my, my, pleasure. my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> All right. Take care. You too. Thanks so much for listening. For more youthful and healthy information, subscribe on my website, shareyogawithmj.offeringtree.com and receive my monthly newsletters. Or if you know how to navigate social media, find me on Facebook slash Mary Jane Waddell. That's Jane with a Y, J-A-Y-N-E, and Instagram at Mary Jane Waddell. Remember, Jane with a Y. This podcast would not be possible without the help of my editor, Dan Jones, from Cocoa Beach Productions. You can find Dan at CocoaBeachWeb.com. And of course, thanks to my generous guests who share their time and youthful wisdom. Remember, the Youthful Older Yogi podcast is presented solely for educational, inspirational, and entertainment purposes. It is not intended as a substitute for a physician or other qualified professionals. Okay, yogis, stay well, stay youthful, and keep sharing yoga.